And so today I, I want to talk about a subject um, that, I, that I've, I've, I can encourage you and challenge you to live out for the next couple of months. We, you know, we're already getting into September. That is crazy. Before you know it, we're going to walk into 2022 and, and whatever God has. And, 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 but there's something that I want to talk about. It's, it's not the same. The subject is, it's, it's not the same. It's not the same. It's kind of like this. Have you ever gone to an event or, or a birthday party or someone invites you somewhere? And um, you, what you, the thing that you have, when you have close friends, the first thing you ask is, hey, are you going to be there? Like you're texting them. You know, this, this person invited you and maybe you know them, but you don't know them that much. But you're like, hey, are you going to be there? Because, you, you know, you feel a little bit insecure because it always feels better to be around people that you're comfortable with. It always feels better to, to attend something knowing that your friend or your spouse or a family member are there because it feels better. It feels like, okay, I can make it through this event. I can make it through this dance. I, I, can, make this, I can make it through this carne. I don't know everybody, but I can, I can make it as long as this person. And when they don't go or the last minute they, they say, hey, I'm not going to go, you, you feel it. And you end up telling them after, dude, it wasn't the same. It's not the same without you. You ever use that term, it's not the same without you? It's the same thing with women. Sometimes what do women do? They go to the restroom six together. Only one has to go to the restroom, but six go. Because there's something, here's the thing, there's something about the presence of a friend, a family member. There's something about the presence of a spouse that changes the atmosphere of where you're going. There's something about it. We can't explain it. We don't know how to, how, to, how to go about it. But all we know is that when their presence is there, something changes. All we know when we were growing up, that when we were afraid in the dark, the presence of our father, when he was there, something changed. And it's the same thing I want to talk about in intimacy with God. That when God's presence is evident in our life, not just on a Sunday morning when I want God's presence, but when, like Pastor Alex said, when God's presence walks with me on Monday morning, when I don't want to go to work, when I don't have to stand out in traffic for school, can we get an amen for traffic? <laughs> Someone's like, call the cops every day. Make, do something. When, when, when it's the presence of God that changes the atmosphere of where we're going. It's the presence. It's the presence of Jesus in our life that we can never be the same. Once you have tasted God's goodness, you can't go back. And when you do go back, it's not even the same. It's not the same. And I want to talk about that because if me and you are going to finish strong this year, we have to get to a place where the intimacy of God is strong enough to take on whatever direction you are going. It's strong enough to take on marital problems. It's strong enough to take on sicknesses. It's strong. It's intimacy that changes the game for me and you. Me and you were created to be intimate with God. Think about it like this. In Genesis, when God creates Adam and Eve... The thing that you notice in the beginning of Genesis, God says something very, very important. He says, we must create them in our likeness. In our likeness. And so, right, when me and you think of likeness, we think of, oh, he's probably thinking about, like, somehow, some way, we're all created in a way that maybe this is how God kind of looks like. Because when we think of likeness, we think images of people. We think images of humanity. We think images of man. I looked, but, but that's not really what God was intending when he created man and woman. He was creating man and woman to be intimate with him. So when he creates them, man and woman, and they come together, in Hebrew they use this thing of coming together. It's really when God says they, they would be united together, coming together, what he's trying to say is this, is that they would be a reflection of the Trinity. They will be a reflection that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are together as one. And me and you are a reflection of what God's created. So, the real, so here's, in other words, me and you are not just created for something. We are created to be someone. To be like God. We were created to be someone. To be like 
God. Not just, just for something, not just to roam around the earth and work. Me and you were created to be like God. That's why when me and you read the word of God, that's why when me and you start to make changes, because we're trying to be like God. The way God responds in the Bible is the way that me and you should respond. The way that God thinks in the Bible is the way that me and you should think. That's why James says that if we lack wisdom, to ask for it. Why do you think Solomon, when he became king, the first thing he asked God was not riches. It was not all the influence. It was not more TikTok followers. It was not more. It, he said, give me wisdom to lead your people. And then God not only gives him wisdom, he adds riches to him. It is to be like him. We are to be, we are a reflection. We were created to be like him. Our marriages coming together as one, it is a reflection of what is already one in heaven. To be intimate. And I want to talk about someone in the Bible that, that had an intimacy with God to the point that his life was not only transformed, but the people around him could not be the same. And it had nothing to do with the man himself, but it had to be who he was carrying on the inside. It had to be an intimacy. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go to the book of Acts, chapter 19. We're going to be in verses 11 through 20. Acts, chapter 19. We, uh, a lot of times, for some reason, we don't preach this, mess, this, this part a lot, and, and I haven't even really preached it much, but I'm grateful that the Lord revealed this. And it says this. It says, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them then some of the itinerant Jews exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying we exercise you by the by the Jesus whom Paul preaches also there were seven sons of Sceva a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified we just talked about magnification magnifying in worship and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all and they con they counted up the value of them and to it tailed 50,000 pieces of silver so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. We see here that, that Paul, in his relationship with God, he had such an intimate relationship with God that even the handkerchief that he would use, the sweat, whatever he had on it, people were being healed. Now, it, here's the thing. It's not, let me sweat and then let me sell it for $10 and you'll be healed like some TV people. It's not that at all. It's that Paul had such an intimacy with God that even the things that were touching him had to be changed. How different would our life look like and our families and our spouses and our kids and even our nation look like if we had an intimacy with God? Because when we have intimacy with God, that is where we find the miracles. Intimacy with God, that is where me and you find healing. It's intimacy with God that I can look at my friend and ask for forgiveness and know that God heals that relationship. It's intimacy with God that I could have peace while everybody else is being chaotic. For some reason, we're still living in times where things are chaotic. We're still living in times where everybody is fearful. I, here's the thing. I am not ignorant to the fact that there is COVID. I understand that there's COVID out there. I am not ignorant to the fact that we need God in our government. Like our, 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 our president, I can go on and on. It's, it's terrible. I am not ignorant of that. But I refuse to live out of fear because that, isn't God's, that was never God's intention for me and you. I refuse to live out of fear. And I am tired of seeing Christians living out in fear every day. 
You know how I can tell people live out in fear? Because when you're around people in a group right now because of COVID, you could tell that they can't enjoy themselves totally. They're always like looking around, kind of stressed, like before they would laugh. And now you hear someone cough, you're just like turning and walking back. God never created us to be in fear. Fear enters when sin enters the world. Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. It wasn't until sin entered that they got afraid of what they looked like. That was actually the original fashion, if you didn't know, your birthday suit. But it's this thing that sometimes we, we, we allow, and, and, and here's the thing. Paul's life was changing other people in an uncommon, unusual, Bible says unusual ways, unusual miracles. And I'm here to tell you that God wants to do unusual and uncommon things in your life this day. God wants to do things different. God, I believe that God can heal you in a moment. I believe God can restore you. I believe God can do something new in your life. But it is up to you to respond back to him in the manner that he deserves. It's up to me and you. Because here's the thing. When me and you reject his presence, that is where we experience anxiety, stress, fear, worry. Everything that God has come against, we experience it by our rejection. Has nothing to do with the goodness of God. There's nothing, the Bible says, there's nothing that is too hard for our God. Jesus said himself, with me, it is impossible. There's nothing. There's nothing that God cannot handle. But for some reason, we've come to a point in our life where we've allowed, we've rejected God in our decisions, maybe. Sometimes we've rejected God. Maybe sometimes we reject God in, in our conversations. Maybe we've rejected God in our belief in him. I mean, whatever the case may be, we've come to a place where we've rejected God. Therefore, we experience the things that he never intended for us out of rejection. But I read this passage about Paul because this is an example for me and you to follow and intimacy with God so that we can see all the good things that we read. Have you read the Bible and you're like, man, I, I, I want to see that. I want to experience that. Can I tell you that that is something that we can experience today, church? Even today, in this time, in this hour, in this moment, to experience these things. It is a principle. Here's the thing, though. If we are going to experience the things that Paul talks about, if we're going to experience the power of God, see, before this happened, Paul had just filled some people with the Holy Spirit. They knew God. They knew the word. But when Paul got there, it was in Corinth, I believe, before this ever happened, they lacked the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, oh, we don't know about that. And then when Paul lays their hands, things are different. And then Paul goes to Ephesus. And where we're reading right now is in Ephesus where the presence of God is being activated and it shows. Because an intimacy intimacy with God shows. It shows. People will notice when you are intimate with God. So what do we have to do? We have to own our relationship. It is not your spouse's responsibility. It is not your cousin, your tia. It is not your brother's responsibility. Your relationship with God comes down to It's not even my responsibility for your relationships. It is yours. And there has to come to a place, church, where we got to own our relationship. When we learn to own our relationship with God, we find out that we are set apart. It is uncommon. There are things that make things, Paul, can I, can you, it's crazy. Paul would just walk. Paul would just touch people. It was his handkerchiefs. It was unusual things. Because the anointing that Paul carried, it is the anointing of God that in your life that breaks the yoke of slavery, the Bible says. It is the anointing of God that's activated in you. It is the presence of God that changes, that sets you apart, that makes you uncommon. What happened to Paul was uncommon. And I believe that God wants to do uncommon things in your life. It is not common to be married today because divorce rates are going up. But in Jesus... We have strong marriages. It is not common to see people healed anymore, so people are bound by things. But in Jesus, we find healing. It is not common 
for people to be restored in their relationships with friends, but because of Jesus, we find restoration. It is not common. We find reconciled. Jesus reconciles us. What separated us was sin. What separated Adam and Eve from the goodness, from the garden, from everything that God created was sin. But I thank God that Jesus stood in the middle and I'm no longer blocked by a wall. Now I have a door to go through. Amen. That I have Jesus to come into my life, to come into my family, to come into my mind. And I no longer am bound by sin. In fact, I am victorious because of his death on the cross and resurrection. It's intimacy. It's uncommon. What God wants to do, it's the anointing sets you apart from everybody else. When Paul entered the room, there was something different. When Paul had come, and here can I tell you something for some of you in this room, that maybe you're like, man, it's just that I'm not like Paul, and I don't have it all together, and I, you, neither did Paul. You know, Paul, if you're new here, if you're new to, to, to church, can I tell you something? The man that we read about, was murdering Christians before he transformed his life, was putting them in prisons. He was there when Stephen, which was a, a man of God, was killed. He approved the killing of somebody, of a follower of Jesus. So his life wasn't all together. But like I said at the very beginning, when you come to Jesus, nothing is ever the same. And God uses his life, and God does miracles in his life. And here's the thing. He had to, he experienced problems. When you study Paul's life, he, he experienced beatings. He experienced to the point where he was a martyr. He experienced problems. Jesus said, we're going to have problems. But here's the thing. In Christ, the problems do not have us. There's a difference. I can have a problem, but the problem can't have me. I can hear things and face things, but those things cannot have me. And God wants to do those things. God wants you to carry an anointing that sets you apart. That when you go into your job, when you go into your school, that people notice, man, why aren't you afraid? Man, how is it that your marriage is so good? Man, why are your kids excelling? Why, why is there this favor? And because it's nothing about you, but it's the God in you. And that's what I'm trying to get you to understand today. That it cannot be the same when we live a life surrendered to him. It cannot be the same when we begin to make decisions to be intimate with God. When we make decisions, daily decisions to choose to be intimate, to make room for God, to make room to hear his word, to make room to pray, to make room to not only do those things, but to live out the word of God, to respond the way God responds. Because we're very good at reacting. But when me and you react to what's happening to us, the problem with reacting is we're reacting in our flesh. But God does something. God responds. God doesn't react. He responds. Reacting makes you punch a hole in your wall. Responding gets you to think twice about it. Reacting says, I'm leaving home. Responding is, I'm staying and working through. It's different. It's when the word of God is in you and when, God, when you have an intimate relation with God, it changes how you live your life. You can't think like everybody else. You can't talk like everyone else because it's the word of God that's in you. It's the presence, the anointing of God that has transformed your life to where you cannot be the same. And it's in church, I'm saying this because it can be very easy to go back to who we used to be. It can be very easy to continue to act like the people were around. It can be very, very easy to think like the news thinks, to think like our coworkers think, to think like our friends. It can be very, very easy to think that way. That is why we need God. That's why we need his word. That's why David said, is your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's why David had the, that's what, it's the anointing of God. David would not be killing giants without the anointing. The Bible says that the Lord 
anointed David. The anointing was the representation of the Prince of God. In fact, it's a beautiful illustration to be saturated with this. It says, but my horn, you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. But my horn, you've exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. In other words, I am saturated with your presence. And it's the presence of God in David's life that he is able to kill giants, win wars, be a king because of the anointing of God that's separating from the rest. It is the anointing of God. It is the power of God at work. Church some, of, church, some of us in this room, we have to get back to the place of hunger, to the place, get back to the drawing board of what am I doing that needs to change? What went wrong? Can we, some of you in this room, you've been saved for a long time, and you can remember when you first got saved, there was a hunger and a passion that dictated your life and that could only happen because of the presence of God and we need to go back to the drawing board and see what happened that stopped me from doing this what do I need to change what did I allow in my life to take over that has kept me that has put a wall between me and God and has kept me from experiencing everything that he has to offer me what is it all about what do I have to do we, we admire athletes all the time. But every athlete that we admire, every singer, every actor, you name it, we all admire somebody, a novella, I don't know, whatever you like. There was work behind the scenes that they put in to be where, who they are right now. To get to where they are, there was work behind the scenes. And the problem sometimes in society is we're not willing to work. We're not willing to work because work takes time takes energy, can be very hard, but it's the work that we put in that makes the difference in our life. The, our faith levels, church, our faith levels, the growth that we want to experience, all of those things are dependent on our direction, depending on what we are willing to do in our life. Just like as a parent in this room, you are willing to do whatever you can for your child's safety. Have you ever thought also your child's safety is dependent on your relationship with God as well? Students, have you ever thought that the favor that you so crave, the influence that you, show, you so desire, have you ever thought that maybe, maybe you've been using it in the wrong way, that's why it doesn't work? Because favor and influence only comes from God. And when God does give you influence, it's to give him glory, not you. Because here's the thing, we live in a society of me. We live in a society where it's about me. We live in a society of substitutes and sometimes cancel culture. Oh, I don't like what you said? Cancel. Oh, I, Pastor, Sam, Pastor Sam said something I didn't like? Let's cancel him. I don't really care. I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow. So, oh. um, But let's, we live in a site where we substitute. It's kind of like, well, have you ever had an off brand of something and it doesn't taste the same or doesn't look the same? Or like when someone buys a fake Rolex trying to look like the real one. There's, we live in a society where it is substitute. We, we are trying to substitute and we do this with God, where we substitute God with friendships. We substitute God for people, for, for TikTok, for we substitute God for all these things. And no wonder we can never get the best of the best. No wonder we can't experience it. We substitute God for, for, for whatever the case may be. No wonder we experience what we experience because we're trying to substitute him for something else. And that's why we have no empowerment. We have no power to, to back up what we're facing. Because here's the thing. Empowerment is not, is imparted. It's not copied. The power that we receive from God. See, the sons of Sceva, they were trying to do miracles off of someone else's relationship. They were trying to do what Paul was doing off of someone else's anointing, 
off of something. Sometimes we're like that. We're trying to live off of someone else's anointing so that maybe something good could happen to me. I'm trying to live off of, I don't know, my grandma's prayer life so that I could do something good. The problem with the sons of Sceva was not just that they were trying to copy Paul. They did not believe in the Jesus that Paul talked about. So they were trying to copy and they lacked belief and they got beat up on by a demon, a demon-possessed person. Because that's not what God desires for me and you, church. God desires real God desires me to own our relationships, to, to walk in the power of God, to walk in the Holy Spirit, to walk in something different. Church, some of us, nothing, here's the thing. It's like this. Nothing, here's, nothing against vegetarians. But there's a difference when I'm eating a black bean burger or an impossible Whopper from Burger King than water burger. Some of us are feeding on black bean burgers when God has given us water burger. Do you get it now? Yes, we get it now. Amen. Hallelujah. We get it. So now you know I'm against vegetarians. I'm just kidding. I'm not. But we're feeding off of substitutes. We're feeding off of substitutes. That God, and God wants to do something fresh and something new. And it's the anointing of God. The anointing of God just sets us apart and empowers us to do what we could not do before. It empowers us to do the impossible, empowers us to look at our issues and not only see an issue, but see a solution. It empowers us to to deal with the stresses of life and not let life stress us out. It empowers us to overcome and be victorious when other people said I would be defeated. It It is the power of God, church, in our life that does that. It's the power of God. And it's the power of God. It's an intimate relationship with Jesus that transforms us. It changes the game for us. The Bible says towards the end, towards the end, if you look in the end, that, um, that when people heard about what was happening, that people with books of magic and, and witches and all these things, they started burning their books. They started burning the things that kept them bound because they wanted to have an intimate relation with you. They realized that, man, everything I was doing before isn't working. Everything that I was doing, everything that I was reading, everything that I was practicing, every, every thought that I had wasn't doing the job. When they heard what Jesus can do through Paul, when they heard what, G, what God does, when you don't follow God and you, the sons of Sceva ran naked, when they saw all of it, they realized, man, I need God because what I'm going through isn't working. What I'm trying to do isn't working. And church, we are created to live victorious every single day. We're not, we were not created to walk into this place and continue to feel like nothing is not, isn't working. You have to get to a place, church, where you are tired of being tired. Where you are done with who you used to be. When you are done trying to substitute God for illegal substances or other things that you think are going to make you better, but you're still the same person from 10 years ago. It's a relationship, relationship with God. It's not the same. It's not the same. And I want to believe with you that whatever God does in, your, does in your life, it can never be the same. It can't. These people that started burning these things, if you study, this was a big thing. This wasn't just like two people came and, you know, threw some books in and walked off. No, 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 no. The Bible, when it shows that, it shows a transformation in a city. Transformation happened when people heard what was happening and responded to it. They surrendered. They burned the very thing that kept them bound. What are things that you have to burn today that has been keeping you bound? For some of you in this room, depression and anxiety has been in your life far too long far too long but in Jesus name it ends today for some in this room you've had some chronic stuff 
illnesses and things that have been following you for far too long, it ends today. For some of you, you've been in rejection mode for far too long. It ends today. We got to be like these people. A perfect example that said, today, I choose to burn what kept me bound. Today, I choose to let go. I choose to surrender. Maybe for some of you in this room, it's bitterness that you've been carrying for a long time that has kept you bound. And you will not find healing until you burn bitterness. It's kept you bound. Disappointment, I don't know. All of us have different things across the spectrum. But here's the thing, church. For us to see miracles and to see change happen, it comes with repentance. Repentance in the Bible actually means for me and you to turn away. To turn away. It's, here's the thing. We, we've been living with remorse, but not repentance. Because remorse keeps you there. Repentance takes you away. Remorse will make you feel bad, but repentance makes you do something to change that issue. And maybe for some of you, it's just God... I need, I, need to, I need to repent. I've been living my own life. I've been living for me and not for you. I've been trying to feed me and not feed my soul. I've been trying to do my, things my way but not do things your way. Like I said, we weren't just created for something. We were created to be someone. And sometimes that someone that we need to overcome is, is me. The battle is me. Because it's me that keeps me from becoming who God's created me to be. We've been, we were created to become, to be, to be like him.